Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Sheena Joslin, who is a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and Professor of Psychology and Physiology at the University of Toronto. She is a Canada Research Chair in Brain Mechanisms Underlying Memory, is a Senior Fellow in the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Welcome, Shia. Thanks. So nice to be here, Gail. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with uh, one of your papers from 2019, the Neurobiological Foundation of Memory Retrieval, Mm -hmm. in which you say memory retrieval involves interaction between external sensory or internally generated cues and stored memory traces or engrams in a process called ECFORI. (laughs) ECFORI, ECFORI, yeah. Okay, so when ECFORI has been examined in human cognitive neuroscience research, its neurobiological foundation is less understood. So before we get into the details of this, uh, Sheena, uh, could you define engram? Sure, sure. So um, I like a really sort of loose, sort of everyday um, version of the term engram. So it originally came um, out of um, a scientist called uh, Richard Semin, who thought that we shouldn't, you know, if we study the, you know, sort of scientific biological processes of memory, what we should do is try and get away from everyday definitions. And um, he defined it as the enduring, the latent modification in the irritable substance, which is stuff going on in our brains that occurs because of an experience. And so what we, you know, sort of loosely think of an engram as is that bit in the brain that's really important in encoding and storing um, information about a particular event. So that's my very sort of loose generic term of what an engram is. Yeah, it's really fascinating. So, you know, uh, people know about neurons, synapses, um, there's sort of the general structure of the brain, but but this is more of a meta um, so it's a meta phenomenon, right? It, it involves multiple neurons. Absolutely. So it's it's like a neuronal ensemble. So a bunch of neurons seem to come together, and uh, they seem to become linked when an event happens. And then these these neurons become like a um, a cell assembly, a bunch of neurons together that seem to encode and store a memory. Yeah. So so memory is really fundamental. I do some work. I, I don't know anything about the brain. I do some work in artificial intelligence, and, and memory is 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 a big problem to solve in, in silicon based machines. And um, th- there are some interesting aspects here. So uh, you say uh, neurons come together to form sort of a circuit or an ensemble, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, are they capable of storing multiple memories at the same time or, or are they specialized? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we think um, there's some data out there, but again, you know, work is ongoing, um, that different um, memories are um, stored by different groups of ensembles. So um, we would have 
distinct but maybe overlapping neurons involved in different memories and that's how the the brain can tell different things apart so if you have you know two events that are very very different you would store them in non-overlapping bunches of neurons or non-overlapping engrams yes i said non-overlapping um engrams so mm -hmm. um I, I can't quite remember so we have 10 to the power nine neurons and each of them has about 10,000 synopsis, uh, synapses. So um, if they are specializing in, in an event, wouldn't we run out of neurons? <laughs> <laughs> right. And it, it, if, if one neuron were, you know, representing one memory, like, you know, the, the sort of prototypic grandmother cell, you have one cell that, you know, is the memory of your grandma. And we think that that's not the way. We think that there can be, you know, because we have so many neurons and say, you know, it takes, you know, 4% of neurons in a you know particular brain region to come together to form an engram. Well, this 4% of neurons, it could be a different 4% of neurons that form another memory. And you could be involved if you were, you know, if I am a neuron, I could be involved in multiple memories, multiple yeah. engrams. It's just who I hook up with at that particular time. Yeah, Th this is really fascinating. So, the ensemble, as you mentioned, um, the connectivity between neurons, mm -hmm. I would imagine is equally important, right? So, so suppose I have 10 neurons, mm -hmm. I could have different combinations, different connectivity among them, and that might give us sort of an exploding factorial possibilities of memories, right? Is that what's happening? Absolutely. Um, the data is still, you know, not exactly um, concrete yet, people, but this is, you know, certainly the guiding hypothesis. Yeah, so, so I know that you have done a lot of, um, lot of experiments here in, in uh, mouse models. Um, so, so what is our sort of the current understanding? Um, Ngrams, I guess, so before I ask that, um, the history of this is quite old, right? It, the, the idea has been around for about 100 years? Absolutely. 1904 is when the idea um, first, yes. I mean, we could probably trace it back to ancient Greece, Plato and Aristotle, but I, I think you can read, a, you know, you, that's sort of like Nostradamus, they said sort of everything, you know, you can read a lot into what they say, but the idea of an engram being this sort of neural um, storage mechanism and how these things happen um, is really 1904 when it was really um, the scientific sort of articulation of this hypothesis was put forward. And, and that was Richard uh, Richard uh, Simon. Richard Simon, yes. Yeah. And so, um, so when you put forward this hypothesis, um, it was so it's sort of a complex thing still, right? So the, the idea here is that multiple neurons are involved in sort of a, a combination ensemble construct mm -hmm. uh, to store memory. And the other term that I can't quite pronounce here is um, the, the process by which you actually invoke something that is stored in the memory. What, what do you call it? ECFRI? Mm -hmm. ECFRI is reading it out. Engram is writing it in. <laughs> right. So, so, so that, you know, writing and reading, uh, mm -hmm. so we have this in computer science, um, but it's, it's fairly, you know, kind of crude process. Uh, but, but here we have something similar, but it doesn't quite work like that, does it? Not exactly like that. I mean, the, the terms are, are, you know, again, I'm using them pretty loosely, but, you know, in essence, that's what people are, are basically talking about, yes. Yeah, so, so, so what's the status quo on that? So with, uh, could you explain some of the, the mice experiments you have run? Absolutely, this? absolutely. So, I mean, this, this term engram has been around since 1904 when, you know, Richard Semin, um first introduced it in a, in a book, which um, ended up containing a lot of really cool ideas about how memories were formed. Um, and unfortunately, he was he was not a very well sort of connected scientist. He wasn't really in the memory field. Um, his ideas were not really picked up by the community. And, uh, you know, he wasn't cited. And and a lot of factors sort of came into play where his his ideas were, you know, pretty much overlooked for a very, very long time. But um, there's a very cool book written by um, Daniel Schachter, who is um, a um, cognitive psychologist. So he studies human memory. 
Um, he said, he, sorry? He said Harvard or? He said Harvard. Yeah, um, yeah. But he, he was a PhD student here at the University of Toronto, where I am. And he um, did a sabbatical while he was a PhD student. Now, no one told me that was possible when I was getting my PhD. No one told me it was possible to take a sabbatical, but he took a sabbatical and he went back and he sort of traced back the history of the scientist, um, Richard Simmon, and sort of looked at his ideas again and his letters. And he ended up writing a book about Richard Simmon. And um, it's a really good book. Not only does it trace his ideas and how they've become pretty mainstream in the sort of current memory um, field, but also the idea of why he wasn't cited or why his ideas were not picked up at the time, even though we look back now and we go, wow, these are, you know, really ahead of their time. Yeah. So, was, so where was he practicing? Where was Richard Simon practicing? So he was in Germany. He was a, a yeah. German scientist um, and he started off um, his scientific career as an evolutionary um, zoologist much yeah. in the line of, of uh, Darwin. And he even has a species of, I think, a lizard named after him. But he got into yeah. some um, scientific problems. He, he had a very problematic life. And he ended up um, getting kicked out of his university. And so he, he started then just theorizing about memory. And he wrote books about memory, two books. And um, he ended up, he had a very, I guess, uh, troubled life. He ended up taking his own life. And then his ideas were sort of dormant. People didn't really talk about them. It wasn't, I think, until um, Dan Schachter wrote this, you know, really amazing book that the idea of engrams were sort of really, really resurrected in sort of yeah. modern terms. So um, although, you know, Semin wasn't very well cited, the idea of sort of finding a memory trace or finding an engram in the brain um, did, was motivated, um, was, was studied a lot way back. So I'm going to cite um, some studies from Carl Lashley's lab. So Carl Lashley was um, a very uh, well-known um, physiologist in, um, in the U.S., and um, he set out uh, about a 30 year sort of quest to find an engram in the brain of a rat. So where exactly is a memory stored? What exact parts of the brain store memory? So he did these really incredibly clever experiments where he would train a rat to find you know, a piece of cheese at the end of a maze. And he would train the rat over and over and over again until the rat had this really amazing memory of you know, how, you know, which right and left turn to take to find this cheese. And then he went in and he would systematically um, lesion out bits of the cortex, so the top layer of the brain, trying to find exactly where this memory was located, figuring that if he lesioned out that bit of the brain that housed this memory, then he would say, aha, I found where this memory was stored. And he did a bunch of different variations on this experiment because he could never ever find exactly where this engram was stored. So he found that it didn't matter where exactly in the cortex, very different regions. Um, it didn't matter where he lesioned. He always found that he got deficits in this task um, according to the amount of cortex that was lesioned. So some bits of the um, cortex were important, but he could never sort of nail it down. And he wrote a very, very influential paper called In Search of the Engram, where he basically concluded that the engram is sort of elusive. We can't really nail it down. And this was yeah. published in 1950. And about, you know, from that time on, I think his data were pretty convincing that uh, we just don't have the tools. We just, the engram is elusive. There's no um, neurobiological way of sort of studying this. So the sort of neuroscience community and the sort of behavioral neuroscience community at the time sort of gave up on, on finding or studying or, or even attempting to find an engram in the brain. So um, people started looking at other types of, you know, what are the molecular mechanisms of memory, um, those sorts of things. Um, and then um, we, um, we and a bunch of other labs have now started to use, you know, different types of tools that allow us to really um, label cells that are active at the time when we, when we train a mouse to do something. And um, these, these really cool uh, molecular tools are allowing us to now, for the first time, I think, in sort of modernish history, to actually find a group of cells that seem to come together and form an engram 
Um, and we know that they're important parts of an engram. They're not the entire engram, but they're important components because if we silence them using a bunch of different techniques where we can sort of turn these neurons off with light using um, optogenetics or using these other ways of, you know, temporarily interfering with the activity of a small bunch of neurons, um, we can uh, we can make the animal behave as if this animal forgot what we had trained it on. And then we test it again the next day and the memory is right there. So it's a really temporal, uh, temporally, um, it's a temporal um, disruption of the memory only when we turn these cells off and not other cells. And it disrupts only the memory that we are, uh, that we have tagged and not another memory. Um, so if we disrupt the engram or the engram, you know, the important component of the engram, we think for this memory, uh, we see memory disruption. On the other hand, what we can do in some really cool studies um, that came out of uh, Susumu Tanakawa's lab um, that were headed up by um, Steve Ramirez and Shu Lu, who were two very, very talented trainees at the time, um, they, sh they did the corollary experiment. So my lab showed this sort of loss of function. We can interfere with these cells we think are part of an engram, and it looks as though the memory goes away. They did the opposite. They said, what happens if instead of giving the animal a really, really good retrieval cue, we give it an internal retrieval cue. So we artificially activate these cells when an animal is not, we, we think, you know, here I'm, I'm using air quotes, thinking about the event. So um, when they turn these cells on artificially using these optogenetic tools, the animal behaved as if it was remembering the learned memory. So um, it's, it's really kind of, um, we're getting into the realms of kind of science fiction now where we can turn on and turn off memories just by um, manipulating the activity of this really small population of cells in the brain. Yeah, it, it, is, it is really getting into the area of science fiction. Uh, let me take you on a, on a, ta on a tangent a little bit, Sheena, yeah. just your perspective on this and return back to the paper. So when I talk to cosmologists, when I talk to neuroscientists, there's a lot of interesting information, but it is unclear to me that if you're getting closer to sort of a holistic understanding, and I, I sometimes wonder if it is a reductionist approach of science, and I, you know, I sometimes tell people that um, God has a sense of humor and I can I can hear her chuckle sometimes. <laughs> uh, because you know it's sort of you get a get a get an idea and you can you know dig deeper on that and you find more uh, noise that you have to explain. So do you think we are getting closer from a neuroscience perspective? Oh that's a really interesting question. I think we are getting closer uh, of a neuroscience sort of perspective on memory, but I think one thing we have to always keep in mind, it's like, you know, a bunch of, you know, scientists, you know, describing their little aspect of an elephant. And we have to, at some point, step back and say, aha, this trunk is actually attached to something else. So we need to yeah, drill down into the details and really get, you know, super reductionistic but also have an eye towards standing back and saying, okay, what does this really mean? How does this all fit together? The sort of big, broad perspective, I think yeah. is always you know, one of the really challenging things. And I don't think we are there yet. We're still in the sort of drilling down stages. Yeah, I mean, your lab is making significant contributions in this area. So when I was reading the paper, uh, you know, I, I didn't understand a lot of it, but um, if we are to a position that we can sort of predict animal behavior, mm -hmm. uh, albeit you know, it's mice models, um, we are getting we are getting closer. I would <laughs> I would think. Uh, and so, in some of these models, so the uh, I don't know Pavlovian training is is this the right term to use here. But so so you you have cues, you have electric shocks and the animals could remember it, but then you could manipulate that memory in some ways, right? Exactly, exactly. So we, we've used um, really um, highly motivated, easy to quantify sort of training paradigms. Yeah, we use um, Pavlovian conditioning. 
So you remember that you know Pavlov trained um, dogs to associate um, a tone with um, food, a tone with food, a tone with food. And sure enough, after a while, they would present the, the dogs, he would present the dogs with food and the animals would start predicting, uh, he would prevent, sorry, present the animals with tone and the dogs would start predicting food and they would start salivating. So yeah. we do the same kind of thing, but just because it's, it's a very simple, we do it in one trial, one trial learning, and it seems to last, you know, the lifetime of the, of the mouse, about two years in our lab. And what we do is we pair in typical experiments, we do slight variations. We pair um, a tone, beep, um, and at the end of it, the, the mice get a very mild um, foot shock. So this foot shock isn't enough to cause any sort of damage or any real pain to the mouse. It's just enough to make them say, what the just <laughs> happened there? Oh my goodness. It's like getting a shock, you know, in the winter and you touch a door handle, it's like, ow, but it, it's, it's nothing long lasting. It's just enough to really sort of, boom, what was that? And the next time the animal hears that tone, they show us a really um, lovely species specific um, defensive response. And that response is called freezing. And if you've ever seen, you know, a small rodent such as a, you know, a mouse or a rat or anything like that, when they're sort of detected outside and you turn on the lights in your backyard and all of a sudden they, they just freeze, they don't move a muscle. And we can really quantify that. And that's one of the really um, nice thing about this sort of very um, simple type of, um, training and simple type of memory is that we know exactly what it should look like. We know how long it takes to form. We know that it lasts a long time and we can really, really easily quantify it. So in the future, we're going to start to look at, um, and I think the future is, is starting to be now, we should look at um, more complex type of memories, um, you know, more of these sort of everyday kind of memories that we encounter in our lives, rather than these sort of very large, you know, highly motivated memories. So that's sort of, I think, the next step for the field. Yeah. And so if I understand this um, correctly, um, uh, Sheena, so... Uh, the the rat get a rat gets a, a shock mm -hmm. along with a, an auditory cue, mm -hmm. and then uh, at post training you can you can provide the cue and the rat will freeze uh, mm -hmm. and and that is proxy for the rat memorized the cue and the and the effect of the cue so mm -hmm. to speak right absolutely so so one thing I you know I was thinking about is so, so going back to the hardware question, so, so this is something that you're exploring. So, so there, there is engrams that is sort of encoding this, this information. Uh -huh. um, and I was thinking, shouldn't the queue be encoded somewhere else? I mean, how, how, will, how do you remember the queue? Right, right. That's, that's a really good point. So we are looking in the area of the brain called the amygdala, which is um, Latin for the word almond. Apparently, our, our amygdalas look like little almonds. Who knew? So uh, we're, we're studying this type of the, this part of the brain called the amygdala. And we think that that is the first um, area of the brain where this tone information and the foot shock information converge. So um, a lot of previous research from many, many really um, amazing labs in the 90s showed us that this area is where to look for this, the, the, the congruence of these two memories that tone predicts foot shock. So we could look in other brain regions to see, you know, just a pure tone memory. Maybe we'd look out in the auditory cortex. We could look in other regions to look at, you know, where, where exactly is the foot shock information. But we think that the amygdala is a part where they converge, where they, they first get associated. Um, and it's, it's important to note that, you know, we don't think that the studies that we're doing in the amygdala are the entire engram. It's probably encompassing many, many different regions of the brain. But we, um, we think that the engram is a critical node in perhaps a much larger network. And when we do our manipulations of the amygdala, we can either get the, the memory to be, you know, turned off or turned on, depending on, on the manipulation. Yeah, so the amygdala is sort of an integration point. Absolutely. It is taking multiple information. So the engrams that you talked about, Sheena, that's all over the brain or some parts of the brain? Yeah, they seem to be all over the brain. They seem to be different components. And it could be that some components are, you know, more important than other components. They're like, you know, in a 
in a, a network, some are really important components and others are not important components, like a, an airline map of, you know, the U.S., you know, Chicago is a really important hub. And um, maybe, you know, Austin, Texas is not a really important hub. So we, we think that um, that the amygdala is is like Chicago. A lot of stuff goes through Chicago. It's a really important hub. So... So, so do we have, I'm going back to humans now, do we have diseases that we know of uh, some, um, you know, some issue with amygdala that results in some, you know, sort of uh, predictable, perceptible uh, uh, symptoms? Really, really good question. So, um, yes and no. So it's really, um, it's always a challenge for um, sort of uh, fundamental discovery researchers, such as myself, to relate everything back to humans. I mean, that's the goal. That's what we want to do. I'm not particularly interested to learn how mice learn and remember. I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting thing, but that's not what motivates me. What motivates me is to really figure out how our brains work and what happens when our brains aren't working quite so well. So I'm really motivated to understand, you know, something like um, Alzheimer's disease. What happens when um, people can no longer recall their past, when people can no longer form long-term memories? And I'm doing very sort of simple studies in mice, trying to get at this really basic, basic process right from the ground up, and then try and build up to what happens in humans. And there's, there's still, you know, a long way to go. You know, mice are not humans. But the types of things that we are able to do in mice, unfortunately, we're not, well, fortunately, we, we, yeah. no one will try in people yeah. for good reason. But I think the, you know, sort of basic findings, the basic understanding of this process will help us um, to, to know what to do when it goes wrong in people. So I think that, you know, a lot of memory disorders, um, either too little memory, such as, you know, Alzheimer's disease, or maybe too much memory, like post-traumatic stress disorder, something really um, traumatic has happened to someone and it keeps invading, you know, their everyday lives. It really interferes with their overall functioning. Maybe that we can understand that and manipulate that at the level of the engram or the memory trace for that memory. Why is that, you know, so intrusive, these types of memories? So I think that, um, that our studies are a long way from that, but I think that, you know, treatments for all these different, you know, information processing or learning and memory disorders in people, I think we'll never find a treatment until we really understand the basic ins and outs of how memories are formed and retrieved. And I think that, you know, our studies and a whole bunch of other labs, you know, around the world are doing studies to try and get this fundamental knowledge so that we can move on to the next step. Yeah, so, so the, do the mice experiment, Sheena, give us some insights into sort of the uh, the longitudinal or temporal aspects of this? So I'm contrasting autism with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we do we have some insights into uh, how that happens? You know, it, it was a functioning brain for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then it seemed to decline uh, as opposed to autism, let's say, you know, uh, from 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 time equal to zero, you had you had a you had a measurable issue. Do we have some insights? So there are there's certainly people um, that are studying this um, and uh, the, the current thinking seems to be that um, with something like autism, um, that maybe there is a, a different type of way that the brain is wired up so that um, people who are experiencing autism are, are just processing information differently. Whereas, you know, with um, Alzheimer's disease, um, they, they were processing information, you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty well. And then some, you know, the insult just kept coming and coming and coming till somehow this process broke down. Um, and there's been some really interesting work um, looking at um, animal models that can be used to gain insights into Alzheimer's disease. So, um, you know, Alzheimer's disease in people is, is quite complex and there's two different varieties or at least two different varieties. And one of them is um, the early onset, which is very genetically based. So we, we know what genes are involved and that's very that's not very common at all. The more common is the one that's sort of later onset and we don't really understand what happens. But if we look at the one that's genetic, we can take the, the genes that we've identified in people and we can put them in mice. 
And when yeah. we put them in mice, these mice become forgetful. They look like they are having memory problems. Yeah. So then we can look at what happens at the level of the engram in these mice. Now, in the very, very early stages, um, these mice that, that seem to model some important aspects of Alzheimer's disease, the engram seems to form. But when the mice try and recall this memory, they can't seem to reactivate this engram. It's like they can't find it. The sort of similar to the tip of the tongue phenomena. I know that information. I know it. I know it. I know it. And you just can't find it. But if they, um, this this is lovely work coming out of um, Susumu Tanagawa's lab led by um, Thomas Ryan, who now has his own position in, um, in Ireland. And they found that if they label an engram in this sort of mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, um, the engram forms normally, but the mice can't seem to recall it on their own. But if they optogenetically or artificially reactivate this engram, they can get the memory to come back. It looks then like the mouse is recalling this memory, suggesting that, you know, one of the problems, at least in this, you know, early stages of Alzheimer's disease, before there's been any sort of um, neuron loss, that the memory is there, the engram is there, the people just can't seem to access it. They can't like pull it out to get all the components they need to recall the memory, which I think is really, really exciting, exciting work. Yeah, this, this is really fascinating, Sheena. So the, what you're saying is that the, and it, it's very intuitive uh, for me without knowing anything about it, the, the information is there, mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that the brain cannot retrieve it efficiently. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so going back to the mice uh, experiments and models, uh, from a, the question from an Alzheimer's perspective would be then, can be somehow the so the the engram if I understand this correctly, you know the engrams have coded the information. The information exists in the brain, mm -hmm. but for whatever reasons, the retrieval mechanisms are not efficient, not functioning properly. Can we can we uh, activate those mechanisms somehow? Yeah. So um, they found that one of the ways to activate these mechanisms is to artificially activate these neurons. Or another way was to increase the connections between neurons that make up an engram. So they think that one of the reasons why this information can't be accessed is because the sort of um, the connectedness of, this ner of these neurons becomes lost. So they no longer have the, the really tight synaptic connections between these neurons. Um, and they, then they, you know, stop becoming a functional sort of um, unit and the, the information can't be accessed again. Yeah, so, um, so, so let's say there's a 50 neurons that, you know, that's sort of in a, in a neuron sample that stored some information. Mm -hmm. And if I understand this correctly, if you lose, if you lose some of them, would you lose that whole information or would you lose part of the information? Yeah, that's a really, really cool question. No one has really done those type of experiments yet. We don't know if the, you know, all neurons are important, but are some neurons more important than other neurons, you know? We, we don't, um, we haven't done those experiments. Can you, can you still make a memory even though three or four of these, you know, 50 neurons are no longer functional or have died or been kicked out of the network for whatever reason? And we don't really know that. I mean, I think the, the sort of overall hypothesis, again, is that if you're a really important neuron and we lose you or your connections, then the memory's lost. But if you're an unimportant neuron, you're just a I don't know, some sort of hanger on, you don't, you aren't really involved in the engram, you're just sort of part of it, and we lose you, nothing would happen. But these, you know, somebody has to really drill down and do these experiments, and they, they, um, they get a little challenging, but I think that the idea is really cool. Yeah. The other thing that's going through my mind, Sheena, is, um, from a computer science perspective, is that, is the question of redundancy. So, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure nature designed this thing. It seems to work pretty well most of the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, but do, do, do you see redundancy in the engrams? In other words, um, you know, I could lose part of it, but, you know, I could still sort of redesign, rewire, re, um, recall what I stored. 
Exactly, exactly. I, I think you've, you've, um, you've summarized it, the thinking really well. We, we, we think that there is redundancy in the system. So if you, you know, get hit on the head for whatever reason, there's some trauma, whatever, you don't lose all of your memories. You can sort of piece things back together and then they become a new memory. Um, people have talked about this as a, a pattern completion type of process. So you don't need everything exactly intact. You fill in the blanks. You, you know, when people show you a partial picture of something, your, your, you know, your mind puts everything in together. You don't even realize that it's a partial picture. And I think the same thing happens at the level of the engram that um, as long as you have enough neurons left and no one quite knows what enough are, but if you have enough engram neurons left, you can sort of fill in the blanks and then the picture becomes more complete. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if this is related, um, Sheena. So, so, you know, in deep learning neural networks, for mm -hmm. example, the issues with that we deal with is what's called um, overfitting. Right. And so, so for generalization, we have a technique called dropouts. Right. So, so you have, you know, this this huge neural network, artificial neural network, I should say. And if you randomly drop um, nodes in this network, we get a fast generalization. And so, you know, it, it's sort of a, a redundancy, um, sort of a sort of a process. Do you see anything like that in the brain? Absolutely. People are thinking about those things now. So there's this wonderful um, influx of, of AI and deep learning type of um, questions now going on at the level of memory. And um, I'm going to put in a plug for my husband, Paul Franklin and uh, Blake Richards. They wrote this really, really lovely review where they sort of melded the two fields together. And they said, OK, generalization of a memory, is that like dropouts to avoid overfitting? Because it's it's really important for us as I think as a species not to have memories that are too 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 specific. We want to be able to have some sort of generalized knowledge. So if I burn myself on the stove, I want to learn and remember <clears throat> not just that specific instance, but I want to say, okay, maybe a good idea not to approach any hot appliance. So I want to generalize this a little bit. And they're looking at how this process might um, come into play. Um, taking a sort of um, deep learning AI bent and applying it to memory and engrams. And, um, you know, experiments are ongoing about this, but the ideas of sort of, you know, feeding off each other, I think is, is, um, is a really exciting um, avenue. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a politician's brain could be a good uh, case study for a non-generalizable system. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they have very specific uh, predictions um, with, with very little data, typically, right? <laughs> and so, 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 uh, so, so going back to the mice brain, do you see, um, I mean, this is really difficult to measure, but uh, do you see uh, certain mice um, more able to generalize compared to others? Uh, it's a tough question to answer, but I was just wondering if there's any data. That's a really interesting question. So there, you know, like there are individual differences in people. There, there are also individual differences in mice. And it's, it's, you know, sort of weird because the mice are all brothers and sisters of each other. So they're all genetically, you know, as identical as we can make them. We use both male and female mice, and we don't see a difference um, between males and female mice. But some mice are much better at generalizing and other mice are not. So um, sort of figuring out why and how and, you know, when is it a good thing? When is it not a good thing? What is normal? What is, is too much? What is too little? Um, are things that um, we're, we're thinking about right now. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I don't know, Shia, generalization has a downside mm -hmm. from a biological system perspective, right? Generalization also means that you don't specialize. Right. And uh, from an evolutionary perspective, if you generalized er generalize early, I would imagine you, you have a higher risk of getting eliminated, right? Sure. I mean, yeah, it's a trade off. You want to be um, you want to have a specific memory, but you also want to have generalized knowledge and yeah. you, you want to be able to have both of them going on at the same time <laughs> if <Yeah>. possible. <laughs>
That's right. Yeah, we'll take a quick break, Shana. We'll come back. We'll talk about some of your recent papers as well. Fantastic. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we're back, uh, Sheena. We we were talking about the neurobiological foundations of memory, uh, both storage and retrieval. Your lab is doing a lot of work in this area um, in some animal models like uh, mouse and mouse models uh, specifically. And we are getting increasingly interesting information um, on things like n-grams and ecphory. The n-grams are bits of uh, the brain that stores information. Ecphory is a process by which the brain retrieves information. Now, we could dig a little deeper. You have another paper uh, in 2019, neuronal competition, microcircuit mechanisms define the sparsity of the n-gram. You say extensive work in computational modeling has highlighted the advantage for employing sparse yet distributed data representation and storage properties and extended neuronal networks encoding mnemonic information. Uh, while neurons that participate in an n-gram are distributed across multiple brain regions, within each region, the cellular sparsity of the mnemonic representation appears to be quite fixed. Uh, at least at the, on the surface, distributed memory and processing, at least from a risk management perspective, would be a good thing, right? Absolutely. Don't put all your memories in one basket. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so before we get to this paper, I want to ask you something, something different. So, um, do we need a brain-like structure for memory? What is our understanding of single-cell organisms or a little bit more complex organisms? Do they learn and memorize? Yeah, so there's some really um, interesting data about even single cell organisms that are able to learn and remember, suggesting that you don't really need a circuit or an ensemble of neurons to be able to learn and remember. Um, these are, you know, obviously single cell, very simple organisms, very simple types of memory. But there are some really cool findings suggesting that you don't need the whole brain circuit. But you know we do have brain circuits and maybe somehow we've evolved to take advantage of circuits in order to um, longer term store more complex and probably more bits of information. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm thinking you know, from an evolutionary perspective, what led us here if, uh, so there has to be some value to memory, mm -hmm. the way that we, we have memory, right? So at some point, it seems like we made a transition to store more long-term memory. Memory, you know, in some sense, as we find from PTSD and other other aspects, there's a downside to memory too. So, so, so do you know from an evolutionary perspective what led us to more complex memory like what we have today? Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I think like with all these sort of evolutionary arguments, you can speculate that the you know, reasons why we have all these different neurons is so that I can recall every single Britney Spears lyric ever written. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if that argument's going to fly, um, yeah. although I can. But um, I think <laughs> that it's because we live in a pretty complex, ever sort of changing environment. And I'm not sure if the single cell organisms that we we're talking about, that their memory has to last for as long or if their memory, you know, needs to be so flexible because their environment probably doesn't change as much. So I think that, you know, the, the more complex, the more we move around in the world, the, the more we need our memory to be able to, you know, guide our future behavior, which I think is um what I would argue is the main purpose of memory is to really guide our next step. Where do we go? Why do we do this? Those sorts of things. Yeah, exactly. So I think there has to be some survival benefits. So Homo sapiens, 
early on uh, the guy or the or the or the gal who could remember where the water hole was or where the line wasn't uh, probably got selected and and then we probably got more and more specialized absolutely and so so going back to the paper this sparsity argument mm-hmm. um this is extremely interesting you know uh, from a computing perspective too so 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 how do you how do you reach this conclusion that microcircuit mechanisms in the brain use more of a sparse n-gram right so that that uh, finding um, and our, our thinking behind it came out of you know reading a lot of different literature showing that you know if we had all these neurons that were active in the brain at any one time you know something like epilepsy might happen we don't we don't want that we only want a really small subset of neurons to be active at any one time plus the fact that again we want to be able to store a lot of different memories and the way you can do that pretty efficiently is by having you know pretty sparse encoding so not every neuron is involved in every memory also, it, it makes it um, safe, you know, if something catastrophic happens, not every single memory would be impaired. Um, and also from a lot of observational studies suggesting that, you know, memories don't, you don't need every single neuron or every single brain cell to store a memory, that it's really, really a small number that you need to store any one particular um, memory. And that's really where our findings sort of started, where we started getting into this, you know, well, well, why is this one neuron um, important in this one um, uh, engram? How is it recruited or why is it allocated to this um, engram? And why is this neuron that is right next to it not? And so we, we started a whole series of studies trying to look at sort of the birth of an engram. You know, how, why are some neurons and not other neurons allocated to become part of an engram? Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, the, the sparsity, uh, before, before we get to that, is the sparsity argument one of optimization? Uh, so it, it can be one of optimization. Um, we, we just sort of looked at it from, uh, okay, other people have looked at this um, sparsity from a variety, using a variety of different techniques, and they see sparsity when they, you know, put electrodes in and then record from a bunch of neurons, they see only a small portion are active, or when they do um, labeling techniques to look at what neurons are active, you know, after we teach an animal something, and they again see sparsity. So we sort of went more from the um, data perspective, but you can also make a sort of theoretical argument about why only a sparse number of neurons would be um, important and, you know, the upsides of that. Yeah. Do you think, going back to our previous uh, discussion, do you think this is also sort of a generalization argument? Uh, Meaning, suppose I have my, you know, the the entire 10 to the power 9 neurons get involved in some useless piece of information, I'll have (laughs) difficulty managing that. Absolutely. And then, you know, you get your next piece of useless information. And how do you um, how do you tell these two you know, bits apart and um, how how do you actually manage all this? And it, it just doesn't make sense for a brain to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know that uh, rats don't have Google, but humans do. Um, di- <laughs> different different tangent, uh, Sheena. Yep. Do you think. Um, you know, so I would imagine early on, memory was a very important thing. Memory of facts. Where was the water hole? Where was the line not likely to be found? Uh, in the Google world, we don't really have a lot of value for information storage. We can just Google it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think our brain is uh, changing? There, there are arguments to be made for this. So people are finding that our sort of spatial navigation skills are not so good now that everybody has, you know, um, things in their car that can help them navigate. You no longer have to learn how to get from place A to place B. You just need to turn on, you know, um, Google Maps in your car and that, that will get you there. And they think that eventually we will lose our spatial sense and we won't be so good at navigating from place A to place B which might be possible. And yes, there is a ton of information on Google and even some of it is true. But (laughs) (laughs) 
what a lot of our memories are personal memories the memory of my experience you know my fifth birthday party or the birth of my daughter or those sorts of things that are not facts but are more sort of um personal types of memories and those we will probably never be able to google although you know my phone has an awful lot of pictures which reminds me of these events all the time so i'm not sure if we are going to sort of um evolve past needing um, memories or that the ability to, to store a bunch of memories? I'm not sure. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Yeah, so, so we'll go back to the paper in a minute. I just want to get your perspective on it. So, you know, I sometimes think that memory is evolving into sort of a societal memory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is less value, I would argue, of personal memories. Uh, if the objective function of Homo sapiens is to essentially replicate and, you know, perpetuate Homo sapiens, then, then really it's the societal memory that is more important, right? So, so do we, are we sort of becoming more of an organism that is, that is you know, that binds us together? There, there's certainly um, an interesting new line of work uh, looking at sort of societal memories, collective memories. And that's, it's, I think it's the first time that people have really thought about this. Um, so Yadin Dudai at the Wiseman Institute in Israel is really, I think, a pioneer in looking at what are these sort of broader memories that everybody seems to share and how are they transmitted? How are they stored? What is the use of them? And I think that's a really um, cool line of research that I never really would have thought about, but I think it's important to study. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's at the sort of the junction of variety of um, variety of disciplines. I think mm -hmm. you know, economics has something to contribute to it. Philosophy may have something to contribute to it, uh, as well as you know, hard science. And um, in an age of you know, sort of making Mars great again. Um, <laughs> process, um, it's becoming increasingly relevant, I think, for um, humans. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think it's, it's a really cool way of looking at things. Absolutely. And so so going back to the paper, so the, the sparsity of the n-gram, uh, did you run some experiments to, to, to show this? Uh, yeah. So we have run a bunch of different experiments using a bunch of different memory tasks. Um, one of the involves the um, Pavlovian fear conditioning, of, as we've talked about. And another one um, we also do um, because we don't want everything to be very, you know, fear based. We want to say, OK, is it is this process also engaged in other kinds of, you know, non fearful memories? And one of the things that we wanted to do was to come up with a, a task for mice that was appetitive that they liked to do. And they would learn something very appetitive in one trial, like they learn the um, Pavlovian fear conditioning. Yeah. So we thought, well, you know, why don't we use food? And food is a powerful motivator for, for mice, um, but it turns out it wasn't powerful enough. So they wouldn't learn very much <laughs> about, you know, one food presentation. And and then we, we changed it to chocolate because chocolate is, you know, <laughs> food, but it's even better than food and chocolate milkshakes. And we tried all these different things that are, we thought very rewarding to a mouse. Um, and then we we happened, of course, upon one thing that mice like as much as they don't really like the mild foot shock. And that one thing is cocaine. So no judgment here, but mice um, really, really, really like one dose of cocaine. And they will go back to the place um, where they received the dose of cocaine and they will remember it for a very, very, very long time. So we've done studies also looking at this very sort of rewarding memory um, also with this, you know, sort of very fearful memory. And um, we looked at, um, you know, how many cells in the amygdala, again, this junction point, um, where um, how many cells were active after we trained mice in these types of tasks. And again, we found a really small percentage, about 15 to 20%, you know, depending on who was doing the counting of neurons seem to be engaged. And again, that goes along with the idea about sparsity, that it's it's not every neuron, that it's a small subset of neurons. Um, and we guessed about 20%. Um, and then we said, well, 
you know, how is this 20% determined, which 20%? And we did a bunch of experiments where we looked at how neurons are um, recruited or allocated into this engram. And um, what we did is we found that neurons that had more, ex neurons that were more excitable, so neurons that were just ready, ready, sort of primed and ready to go, were the mm -hmm. ones that were recruited into the engram. So out of all the neurons, we could artificially bias some neurons to become a little bit more excited than their neighbors. And they were the ones that went on to become part of the engram. And we could do it sort of without doing any sort of um, manipulation, just those neurons that happened to be a um, bit more active than their neighbors. And they were the ones, again, that became part of um, the engram. As if they were somehow primed, they were ready to go. Anything that seemed to, any big event that happened, they were going to be part of the engram that seemed to support this kind of memory. Yeah, that, that's so interesting, Sheena. So the neural competition mm -hmm. talk about and and so what we're saying is that the more excitable neurons get recruited into the engram, mm -hmm. and uh, so, so so that's one uh, I guess one attribute, right? It's, so you I think you also find that neurons that are sort of more interconnected have a higher probability of getting recruited. Um. There's also some um, ideas about that, but um, one of the really cool thing is that we think that, again, there's only a certain number of neurons that can be recruited. And once one neuron is more active than, than its neighbors, one cool thing is that we think it actively inhibits its neighbors. So this one neuron sort of wins this competition and not only does it win, but it also sort of pushes down the loser so they don't come up to become part of the engram. And we can interrupt this process by doing a you know, number of different manipulations and we get a bigger engram and it's sloppier. The memory just gets sloppy. The memory is incredibly generalized. So um, we find that the, the sparse memory is a very specific memory. And when we disrupt this allocation process, the engram becomes bigger and the memory becomes sloppy. <laughs> yeah, those, those neurons are really human. They, they are. And it, it's it's very much, you know, I, you know, I want to be I want to be the winner and they you know seem to do whatever they can do. And then they, they suppress the losers like all, you know, the in-group in high school, the in-group becomes the in-group and they keep the out-group out. Yeah. So. So so, so if, if we evolve into more of a, a, a tangent, you know, more of an egalitarian society. <laughs> I think our brains have to change because our brains are very really much a winner takes all type system, right? Absolutely. And if we I think if we were to equalize the excitability across all brain regions, um, so we would either increase the excitability of all these neurons, I think that um, allocation and memory wouldn't happen very well. So we've, we've tried these kinds of experiments where we increase the excitability of a whole bunch of neurons. And like a high tide lifts all boats, we couldn't get the winners to come out in this. Memory was really, um, the engram, first of all, was really large and memory wasn't very specific. So again, this big sloppy type of generalized memory. We need um, some neurons to stand out at any one time. And then we need, then these neurons become the neurons that are allocated to this engram. And we think that this, um, the population shifts over time, that at any one time, a small population is more excitable than the others. They win the competition. And then, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, they're, they, they um, become refractory. So they are not part of the next memory for, you know, that happens 24 hours later, they're sort of done. And a new population um, becomes more excitable and they're recruited to the second memory. So in this way, we think that the, um, the engrams become non-overlapping and we can remember distinct events distinctly. This is one mechanism we think that allows us to um, separate the different engrams and remember things distinctly. Yeah, so, so let me ask you this, uh, Sheena. So uh, do you think this is an optimum design or is it sort of happenstance? Um, we just got here by random random chance so so if, if you were god <laughs> uh if you were to redesign the brain would you would you make any changes 
Um, I would certainly make it easier to understand for um, a scientist <laughs> like myself. That would be one thing. Awesome. I would make it easier to fix when things go wrong. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I would redesign it. I I mean it's it's it would be lovely if we could understand it a bit better. And um, you know, sort of evolution doesn't always it's not always optimized for the yeah. you know, world's most beautiful design. It's like, you know, when people are coding, sometimes they want to go, oh my goodness, I should go back and redo the whole thing. And it it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> sometimes something bad and you build on it, build on it, build on it, build on it, and it works and you don't fiddle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I think the whole universe is an eight-year-old kid. You know. <laughs> Running around with uh, with bunch of buttons uh, out there, uh, and, and so so in conclusion, then um, you, you continue to do a lot of research in this area. Uh, you and your uh, your lab and your graduate students, um, you have made a lot of progress in understanding how um, neurons work together, create engrams, which is sort of a proxy for storage, and then how that information is retrieved. We have some disease states there uh, where you know this process doesn't doesn't work that well. So if you look forward five ten years, mm -hmm. uh, where do you think we might make the biggest leaps in terms of understanding this? Right. So I think we're you know we and other groups around the world are going to continue to look at this process. We're going to look at you know more complex memories. We're going to look at over time what happens. Um, you know, are there you know drop out of cells, does the memory generalize, those sorts of things. But I think the big leap will be to take the knowledge that we've gained from using um, you know, experimental studies in the lab and apply it to humans. That's gonna be the huge yeah. leap. I'm not sure when that's gonna happen. I would love to think it's like in the next five to 10 years, but you know, it's, it's really hard to gauge the, um, the time course of science and I, I know that um, you know researchers like like me. We always sort of justify what we do, you know, to granting agencies and people like that, and saying, "Okay, we're going to have you know a, a drug that's ready in you know five years, and then we're going to be able to solve things." And the drug never happens because things are way more complex than we would like to think at the beginning of projects. So I think that um, you know translating what we know to humans might be further down the line. But I also know that there's no way that we can try and fix, you know, memory disorders in, in people without this knowledge. So it might take longer than I would like to believe. But without this, I think that we are just sort of lost at sea. I think we really, really need this fundamental, basic, underlying knowledge in order to make any kind of, kind of advance in, in treatment of people. Yeah, so so I just want to ask you one final question. So, do, do you think it's translatable, though? I mean, you know, you look at the zebrafish, hundred hundred thousand neurons or something along those lines, and we see behaviors in zebrafish, for mm -hmm. instance, very similar to humans. And so, uh, without knowing anything about it, um, my intuition tells me that these brains are reasonably translatable. Do, do you think it's not the case? Oh, I think that we can learn a lot from all kinds of studies and all kinds of species. And I think that they're all super, super important and super valuable. And you never know when you're going to be at that aha moment. Aha! <laughs> now we can really apply it. And I think that, you know, during this COVID crisis, um, that we're really learning the importance of doing all kinds of different research on processes people might never have thought were important. And, you know, who thought that understanding, you know, this, this one virus was going to be super important and, you know, the, you know, understanding mRNA and all those sorts of things. But now it's like, oh, of course, everybody in the whole world is depending on this research that started out, you know, being kind of controversial. People weren't funding it. And mm -hmm. now it's like, yeah, we all recognize the importance. So I, I think that studies in zebrafish, in single cell organisms, in rodents, and all these things are super important to, you know, cracking what I think is the most complex thing in the in the universe, which is, you know, the human brain. <laughs> so we believe. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent, Sheena. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast.
providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.